It's loud today, so I'm just going to talk and hope that you get quiet while I talk. We have an SI session tonight and tomorrow. And uh, yesterday night I sat down and took your test, so we can go over it tonight because now I know how to do it. It was a hard test, so if you want to talk about it, we can do that. Anything else? I don't think so, but I need a new battery. I think I need a battery. Pickup's pretty bad. All right, let's talk about the test. I know I'm not the, I was not the most popular person on campus Thursday. That's all right, it's not a popularity contest. I do have. First of all, I have not posted the scores because I'm not happy with my TAs, okay? It's not going to affect the score you've got, but I am discussing the results of this test with the TAs. Mainly, I, I have a problem when there's a score written on the front page of the test and there are no marks as to why you gained or lost points on the question. Um, and so I'm, I've decided, I spent the whole weekend trying to figure out what I wanted to do with it. One option was give all the tests back to the TAs and say regrade all of them at the risk of you, your scores going down, because if I do that to the TAs, they will, they may, will is not a good choice of words, they may take it out on you. That's not reasonable. I'm satisfied with the results, um, and I think they did a good job in grading. I just don't like it when you don't get any feedback. So um, I did not post the scores yet. In addition, you're not, I'm not giving them back today because I didn't have them sealed and ready to give back. So we will give them back on Wednesday. But we're taking bets. Everybody asks me, what, what do you think the average is going to be? I will never predict because I can never win. If I give you a score and the, the average is higher than that, you'll all say, well, you obviously didn't think we knew what we were doing. And if I give you a score and the average is lower than that, you'll tell me that test was too hard. So I can't win. So I don't make guesses. So what do you think the average was on the test Thursday? 67. 42, 55, 5. It wasn't that bad. Just, I mean, so you can share this information with next year's students who get stuck with me. The tests get harder as the year progresses. Yes, that was a hard test. But the next one won't be as hard. My intent is to push you hard for most of the year and get harder and harder. If you compare this last test with your first test, yes, the average on the very first test was 82, so it was much easier. Uh, but also the level of difficulty of this test was pretty high. Your next test, I will try to cut it back a little bit. Please don't take that to mean you should relax. It's still going to be challenging. But the average, the mean, the median, and the mode, all three, was 70. What? That's what it looks like. <laughs> so two people in this room got perfect scores. At least one of those two people is here. I can't remember who the other one was, but I think that they are, yeah, they're here too. So both people are here. Um, there are seven people with scores below 40. Um, the median, or the big peak there in the middle, this one, is the 70. And you can see that um, 80, 80 was also a mode. So there are as many people who scored 70 and has go scored 80. Um, this is, from a statistical st point of view, this is a pretty nice looking curve. Does the fact that it's a 70 cause me headaches? No, because at the end of the semester, because of the way the grades are all set up, um, it should work out so that the class average is 80, which is what I've been shooting for from day one, so. Turn that one on, set that one down. All right, does this one work? Yes, now I can hear it. So, um, yes, I agree that if you're used to getting 90 averages on tests, the 70 average causes you heartburn. Um, but for me, it's, it's 
this worked out well. Um, and so I'm satisfied with the grades. When I look through the grading, it looks like the TAs were consistent in their grading. I don't think they were unnecessarily harsh, but I'm not happy that they didn't give you more feedback. I am going to post your grades on Blackboard, but as I said, I didn't decide till today what I was gonna, whether I was going to give them back to the TAs to be regraded. So I will be posting them to Blackboard. Yes, they'll actually go up tonight sometime. They're ready to go up now. The paper will be up hopefully by the end of the week. The paper won't be up till I'm done. They can read that. Hey, folks, does anybody here not know how to read? Okay. There's an announcement up there that Amelia wrote. Okay? Amelia, they can read. Give them credit for reading. I'm sorry, Amelia. Yes, let me talk about that. Um, I will be posting to Blackboard tonight a PDF document that you will complete to assess, to score you and your partners. I insist that you use that document because when you email it back to me, it will allow me to extract all the data quickly and easily. I won't have to take 275 emails and try to con deconvolute them to get the scores. Using that form will do it for me. So that's why you haven't got the form yet. I had to make sure it would do what I want it to do, and I still have one last test to make sure it works. So it'll be a PDF document, it'll be available on Blackboard, there will be an announcement emailed to you saying it's there. Download that form, complete it, you'll be required to put your name in and the score you want to give yourself, your partner's names and the scores you want to give them. There's a room in there for comments. Your scores should add up to 60, whether there are three, four, or five people in your group. Um, it will still add up to 60, and then I'll do some magic with the spreadsheet to normalize everything. Um, so if you want to give yourself 60 points and your partner is zero each, that's fine. But if you don't make a comment in that regard, I probably will be getting a hold of you. If you want to give everybody equal score, again, I would expect that you have some comment. Because the odds that everybody did exactly the same amount of work, realistically, are pretty low. I'd love to say that happens. but in no group that I've been involved in is that the case. Somebody always dominates. I expect that. I also hope that nobody dominates so much that somebody gets away with doing nothing. The other thing I will be doing is I will obviously be comparing scores with your partners. And the best way that I can tell that there was discontent in the group is not because the scores are all different, but because the scores are dramatically different. I mean, I expect there to be variation. You, you can go ahead and consult your partners if you want and come to agreement saying this is what everybody deserves. That would be the best thing to do. Or you can just all do it blindly and see what happens. Either way, either of those extremes is perfect. You can all do it independently and see what happens, or you can all do it collaboratively and see what happens. But to get two of you to agree on what the scores are, and two more to do it separate, that'll show up real loud and clear when I look at them. So I encourage you to talk with your partners, or not talk to them, but don't do half and half. The points will figure into your paper grade, but I don't know, I don't know how yet. Some percentage of your paper grade will be based upon how you rank your partners and how they rank you, but I don't know what percentage. How about extra credit opportunities? There'll be plenty. You will get enough to earn your 10 bonus points. I had somebody email me something today, and I've, I'm taking it into advisement. There, I would like them in by Friday. Okay, So that gives you three days for sure to complete them. But there will be more bonus opportunities. Near the end of the semester, they start to come fast and furious. Uh, because there's lots of things going on, and you have lots of things going on, so um, there's ways to, to make it. For example, the Chem Fiesta will be a bonus opportunity, um, and so that's one that's a pretty easy one to get. Other questions? Um, PC. 
There it is. When, if you log on to Blackboard today, I think, there we go. There's a revised schedule that I posted today that takes out this chunk here last week and moves everything down. So we're doing chapter 18 for a couple days now. So, all right? So you can take a look at that and we'll move on. Other questions? All right, now I need the board. Go ahead and. Give me some lights and some board space and stuff, so. Chapter 18 takes us back to thermodynamics. The reason why we're going back to thermodynamics. I missed the middle. You missed the middle. It's at the end. That's all right. The reason why we're going back to thermodynamics is because now that we've looked at equilibrium, there's got to be some relationship between why chemical reactions occur, thermodynamics, and the equilibrium constants that we've just talked about. So that's where we're headed with this. The other is we're going to review a couple of the things that we've talked about before um, and make sure that we've got all that down. Whoa, there's all kinds of fun stuff up there. Leave it up there, I don't need it. The top board, I don't need that one. I'll just live without it. Huh? Yeah, I'm just going to use it. Yeah, I'll just use that at some point. Just a couple, re review a couple of things that we talked about previously. State functions. are functions that are independent of path. They don't matter how you get from point A to point B. All that matters are po the initial state and the final state, point A and point B. So anything else is, is immaterial. Uh, so for example, if we want to calculate the total energy change or the total enthalpy change of a reaction, the initial state of the reactants, the final state of the products. To be complete, the enthalpy change of any reaction is equal to the sum of the heats of formation of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants. The superscript zero, remember, just means standard conditions where standard conditions are 25 degrees C, one atmosphere of pressure, one molar concentration. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that we have to worry about. Okay. The other thing to remember is that the delta H of formation of any element in its most stable state will be zero. Then it's just a question of what is the most stable state for something like nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, hydrogen. The most stable state is a diatomic molecule. For most other compounds, it's a monatomic atom, uh, phosphorus and sulfur being the two other exceptions, P4 and S8. But one of the things that has never quite felt right about this is if I plot delta H on one axis and this reaction coordinate on the other axis, 
and I start with my reactants. and end with my products. This one makes pretty good sense. You go from high energy to low. So delta H in this case is less than zero. It's an exothermic process. Just to try and clarify one of these, this reaction coordinate. The reaction coordinate could be time. You start with reactants, and after some amount of time, you get products. It might be concentration of the reactants. You start with a lot of reactants, you end with just a few reactants. So that reaction coordinate is just saying, how far along are you in the process? In the case of an equilibrium process, it's your initial conditions and your equilibrium conditions. So there's lots of different things that the reaction coordinate could be. This is okay. It's downhill in energy. And as we said early on, all chemical processes try to go downhill in energy. Well, if that's the case, Why is it possible that there are some reactions that happen where delta H is greater than zero? They're endothermic. They go uphill in energy. And previously we said if there's, to drive something uphill, you have to put energy into it. And in this one you do. You have to put heat energy into it. The heat energy has to come from somewhere. In the case of when we define system and surroundings, we got to get all these definitions back under our belt. The system is what we're interested in. The surroundings are everything else. In that top case, the system loses energy to the surroundings. In the bottom one, the surroundings contribute energy to the system. Well, think about that for a second. I've got a glass of ice water. What's the probability that that's going to happen? What's the chance that that glass of ice water is going to freeze? It's a trick question. This is a true trick question. It depends on where you put it. If I put this glass of ice water at the South Pole, the probability is pretty darn high. But if I put this glass of ice water in uh, Bermuda, it ain't going to happen. Okay, if I put it in Cleveland this time of year, hopefully it won't happen. Let's see, the first pitch is in, what, 10 minutes? It might happen. Um, last year it did, right? They got snowed out on opening day last year. So the chances of, of that beaker of ice water freezing, in other words, energy coming from this thing and, and causing this to freeze are pretty low. It isn't going to happen. More likely, it's going to melt. You're going to get a flow of energy in one direction or another. And so there's got to be something going on that drives these reactions. And that something that we're going to talk about in the definition in the book is great. It makes no sense. is entropy. Okay. Most of you have learned, if you've had any chemistry or physics before, you've learned a definition for entropy. I'll probably ask you to unlearn it. Okay. I'm going to give you a slightly different definition. The definition you probably heard was disorder or chaos. 
and something with a high entropy had a high amount of disorder or a low amount of order or it's very chaotic if it has a high amount of entropy and that's an okay definition it's not a great definition the reason is because when we we're talking about enthalpy over here we were talking about energy changes well entropy is going to be related to enthalpy and so we want to put it in energy terms and disorder tells me nothing about energy it just tells me that if you come into my office three months after the school year starts it looks a heck of a lot different than it does on the first day of the semester because now I've got 18 boxes of tests laying around my office I've got eight textbooks in various places there are pens pencils markers all over the office but on the first day it starts out pretty nice and neat the natural tendency of my office and my apartment and probably your room is to go from a state of order to a state of disorder what do you have to do to keep your room neat and organized you have to expend some energy in order to keep your room neat and organized you have to expend energy if you don't expend any energy it will naturally fall into a state of disorder unless you aren't in there at all in which case it might stay that way other than the dust that's all over everything so what we're going to define entropy now as and this is so vague it's terrible but entropy is just places to put energy the number of places to put en energy okay I thought you had something you were going to throw at me I hope not it's a really big apple so how am I going to make this work I have to compare three things one is solid ice frozen water the next one is liquid water and the last one is water vapor and I want to look at the entropy of all three of those if I've got perfectly crystalline water I know there's a water molecule here and here and here and here and here and here and every single position that I look at every water molecule is surrounded by six more water molecules they're all identical the number of different places to put the energy is very very small because every water molecule looks like every other water molecule so the energy that any one of those water molecules could have is the same as any other water molecule it's sitting there it's going to be able to vibrate forward backward up and down only so much as those six neighbors allow it to do that so the amount of energy every single water molecule has is exactly the same so there's really only one place to put energy and it's in a water molecule that's surrounded by six more water molecules what if I make it a liquid now you don't have that nice structure now the liquid is dispersed over all different shapes so water molecule Joe over here and water molecule Sue over there look at environments and see completely different things they're still moving around but the environment around one water molecule may have lots of other water molecules around it at some instant in time where that one over there might be moving faster so there's not very many water molecules so now you've got diff many more places to put the energy if you look at the gas now every water molecule is moving completely independently of every other water molecule they're moving at every speed you can imagine every one of them has a different kinetic energy and so now if you map out the distribution and we've already done this a couple of times of those molecules and I find out that some of them have a certain energy and there might be more than one with that energy there's a distribution of energies now I've got lots of places to put the energy that's in the system nature's natural tendency is to go from a state of just a few places to put energy to a condition where you've got lots of places to put energy 
if I take an ice cube and I set it on the counter, nature will make it so that that ice cube will melt. It will not want to stay as a crystalline structure. If it's at a low enough temperature, it will. But if it's a low enough temperature, what happens to this curve? Remember, this is the curve for one temperature. Here's a different temperature. What can you tell me about T2 compared to T1? It's greater. As you raise the temperature now, you get even more places to put the energy. If I lower the temperature, I have fewer places to put the energy. So entropy is going to simply be a way of the number of places we can put the energy. Now, if you want, you can take PCHEM and start to count each and every different place to put the energy. Or if you really want, you can take the graduate level PCHEM class and have to tell me exactly how many different states of energy are there. I'm never going to ask you that. I'm not even going to ask you to try to count how many different places are there to put energy. What I will ask you to tell me is, if I've got a solid and a gas of the same compound, which one has more places to put energy? The gas. So the entropy of a gas is always going to be higher than the entropy of a solid. What if I compare something like hydrogen with something like aspirin. Now, which one has more places to put energy? Well, if you think about hydrogen, and if they're both solid, we're at a temperature where they're both solid, the hydrogen can only vibrate like this. Aspirin can vibrate 16, 21 times 3 is 63 minus 6. It can vibrate 57 different ways. I will never ask you to tell me all 57 of them. But aspirin has 57 different ways that it can vibrate, where hydrogen only has one way. Both of them can translate, right? They can move in straight lines, x, y, or z direction. Both of them can rotate around the x-axis, around the y-axis, around the z-axis. But hydrogen can only vibrate one direction, and aspirin vibrates 57 different ways. So which one has more places to put energy? Aspirin. What can you guess is going to be true about the number of atoms and the entropy? As you increase the number of atoms, you increase the entropy. So solid, liquid, gas, you're increasing entropy. As you increase the number of atoms, you increase the entropy. Guess what? Why did I start here? Enthalpy is a state function. Entropy is going to be a state function. It's given the symbol S. And just like enthalpy, the change in entropy of a reaction will be equal to the sum of the entropies of the products minus the sum of the entropies of the reactants. They're not delta S's this time. Why not? Why do you think they're not delta S's? What's true about entropy in terms of solid, liquid, and gas? If I've got hydrogen solid, hydrogen liquid, or hydrogen gas, I'm changing the entropy. The entropy is never zero. 
except one time. When? The entropy of a perfect crystal at absolute zero is zero. That's the only time the entropy will ever be zero. How easy do you think it is to get a perfect crystal at absolute zero? <laughs> it, it's, it's not going to happen. So the entropy So that's the only time you'll have an entropy equal to zero. So we don't have delta S's now. We can actually get the absolute value of the entropy. We can measure it. It's not a hard thing to do. You won't have to. How are you going to solve problems with entropy? The same way you solve problems with enthalpy. All right, calculate the delta S of this reaction. We go to the appendix in the back of the book. And if you look at the appendix, Guess what, I was wrong. I might want the screen. Yeah, I do want the screen. I can't see it. That's all right. This is appendix, I don't know, something or other. Appendix two in your book. And if you look in the appendix at the end of the book, you will find that there's a data table that lists the compounds, the delta H of formation. On the first column and on the last column, you'll see the entropy of the compound. Now you can't talk about the entropy of formation because to, to make anything at 298 Kelvin, at 25 degrees C, is going to require there to be some entropy there. So the only thing that has zero is that at zero Kelvin. And we're never going to do anything at zero Kelvin. So if you look at some of these values, look at aluminum solid, the delta H of formation of aluminum solid. Aluminum metal is zero, as we expect it should be. The entropy of aluminum is 28.3. Notice the units change on it. it. The enthalpy has units of kilojoules per mole. The entropy has units of joules per mole. Kelvin. There's a temperature unit in there. There has to be a temperature unit because it depends on temperature. If you look at bromine liquid, you'll see the delta H of formation is zero. But the entropy of bromine is 152. Well, that makes sense. Aluminum is a solid. It has a relatively low entropy. Bromine is a liquid. It has a relatively high entropy. If I work my way down here. HBr gas, the delta H of formation is negative 36. It's negative. It's exothermic. And the entropy is 198.5. What's this one? Carbonate ion. We haven't talked about ions yet in delta H's. We're going through this chapter. But your del the delta H of formation of carbonate ion, let's see, carbonates are insoluble, is negative 676 kilojoules. It's huge. It's got a negative entropy change. Most of these ions up here, aluminum ion, negative 313. There's not a whole lot of negatives on this sheet. There's another one, negative 55. There are always ions that have negative values. So you would look these up and you could calculate the delta S for any reaction, the same as before. What does it mean if it's a negative entropy? What does that mean? It means you've gone from a state of order to a state of disorder. Or you've gone from just a few places to put the energy to a lot of places to put the energy. Ooh, or was it the other way around? I hope that wasn't a soda. Oh, good. Oh, it's just a cell phone, that's all. Oh, yeah, toss it through the air and see if it lands in her hand. That would not be a good thing. What is a negative entropy? So a negative entropy means that the entropy of the products are lower than the entropy of the reactants. So the final entropy is lower than the, the initial entropy. Well, why is that possible with an ion? 
if you've got an ion, now there's not the crystal structure for it to put energy in. So that's why that comes out that way. So we're going to calculate delta S the same way. The other thing, though, is this other thing in the middle. Twice in one day, not bad. Delta G. We have one more thermodynamic function to talk about. Now I don't need the screen. So why don't you pull, push that up and give me light. There it is. If I hit stop, it all stops? I never knew that. The last one we're going to talk about is the free energy. To understand why it's given the symbol it is, it's the Gibbs free energy. The Gibbs free energy is given the symbol G. There is actually one more term, but you don't have to worry about that till PCHEM. You did that one, didn't you, Helmholtz? Hmm? The Gibbs free energy G is equal to the enthalpy minus the temperature times the entropy. Or if you calculate delta G's, for a constant temperature process, the delta G, the change in free energy of a reaction, is its enthalpy change minus the temperature you do it at times the entropy change. So we talked up there how to calculate delta H and delta S for a reaction. We can get delta G's for a reaction. The nice thing about the Gibbs free energy is that the change in free energy of a reaction, just like the enthalpy change, is the sum of the free energy changes of the products minus the sum of the free energy change of formation of the reactants. And, just to make it real nice, The delta G of formation of any element in its stable state is going to be zero, just like the enthalpy of for entropy, or excuse me, enthalpy of formation. So both enthalpy and free energy have a value of zero for forming elements in their stable state. Now, I'm going to show you where it's going. So all three of these will work the same way. We can look up appendix values in the appendix. We can calculate delta G for reaction, delta H for reaction, delta S for reaction. But to tie them all together, well, before I do that, why do we call it free energy? I'm going to come back here to this picture. If both of these reactions happen, this one's going downhill in enthalpy. This one's going uphill in enthalpy. This one's requiring you to put energy into it. That one's giving energy off. Why should they both happen without any input from me? 
The answer is you can't look just at the enthalpy to figure out if a reaction is going to happen. Instead, we're going to be more concerned with that. If delta G has a negative value, we're going downhill in energy. It's called free energy because any reaction that has a negative value for delta G is able to give you energy that you can do something with. So any reaction that gives us energy is one we want. And so we're going to say that for reactions that have a value of delta G less than zero, those reactions are spontaneous, which does not mean the same thing as instantaneous. Instantaneous means it's over in the blink of an eye. It doesn't take very long. Spontaneous means it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. If you've all semester long, you've been hearing me say that every single diamond wants to be graphite. The delta G of the reaction going from diamond to graphite is less than zero. Every single diamond in the world wants to give up its energy and become graphite, but it doesn't happen. It should. Thermodynamically, it's going to happen. It's a spontaneous process. The reason why it doesn't, though, is that hill that's over there. You've got to climb up a hill in order to get to the top of the peak, and then once you get up there, you're likely to have what you want. This one's not too surprising. If delta G is greater than zero, it means it's non-spontaneous. It doesn't happen without help. You have to put energy into it to get it to happen. What do you think delta G equals zero means? Thomas? Go ahead. No, in this whole chapter we're going to be talking, what, we'll be talking about. Well, that would be for enthalpy. Exo and endothermic reactions are, enthal are enthalpy arguments. I can talk about exo, what is the word? Exergonic and endergonic, thank you, uh, reactions. I don't like using the term, so I just say delta G less than zero. So no, we won't be just talking about thermal energy. We'll be talking about other kinds of energy, too. Would you say that that was uh, that one energy graph I was trying to do? <coughs> the energy that we need to get over the hill, wouldn't you need to help it or something to get over the hill? Yes, you have to help it get over the hill. So wouldn't it then in that second? No. Spontaneous simply means that the initial state is higher in energy than the final state. It doesn't say how it got from here to here. What does a catalyst do in a reaction? It speeds up a chemical reaction. Why does it speed up the reaction? Because when you're going from here to here in a reaction, I can change the height of that hill by adding a catalyst. So a catalyst changes the path to make that hill shorter. This one, delta G equals zero. What do you have when delta G is equal to zero? So when delta G is equal to zero, you're at equilibrium. And that's where we'll end for today. I will see you on Wednesday. Yes, I'll bring the test with me Wednesday. better talk about that.